Uh, thank you, Johnny. Okay, Scott, welcome back, and we look forward to your message today. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try a whole bunch of different kinds of new things today. Uh, when when Bob Moore asked me uh, if I could do some sessions during Lent, I'm like, well, yeah, sure. What the heck? Um, but it's not like I had a good old theme tied in. And, and so aside from Lent, right? And uh, I decided what I would do is fall back on the standard texts for these weeks of the year. And we'll talk about that in a second. But before we get into all of that, I wanted to show y'all something really creepy. Um, I showed my breakout group, but I got to, this is just too weird. I got to show people this. So y'all know I do a lot of genealogy and I have this photo of my three greats grandmother. She was born in 1813 down around Eatonton, Georgia. She died in 1912 in Texas. So there's a genealogy company now that will take these old photos and do this. That's pretty darn creepy. That's pretty darn creepy. You know, uh, just think about all these people that you can sort of bring back. There's bound to be some kind of a, of a theological message in that. But so for today, we're going to talk about some different ideas using the regular uh, passages for Lent. And, and I'm hoping that y'all will, will share and participate um, because that makes things go a whole lot better. Because uh, So feel free to unmute and jump in either with questions or with, with, with when I ask questions. And then I'm going to be back not next week but the two weeks following that. And I'm gonna kind of continue in this, this regular readings. So disoriented. Have you ever felt disoriented? What does that mean? What does that mean to you to, to think of disoriented? So like, does that mean lost? Does that mean you're in a place and you don't really know what's going on? Does that mean uh, sometimes people will say that, that they can't find, can't find their directions? Or they might be confused. You know, some people will even say that maybe they're uh, uh, kind of dizzy. But I think a lot of these have to do with things aren't right. Things aren't right. Things are out of sync. It's, it's very much out of sync. And it's out of, it's, um, where did my pen go? So disorientation, uh, this is going to be a theme for us as we, as we go through this session. Um, it, it, it makes it so that things aren't where they ought to be. We were somewhere where we kind of understood, and now we're not, and now we're not. And, and that fits in as we, as we look at our text for today. Now, yeah, this is the third Sunday of Lent, but I just wanted to spend a couple seconds to recap how the Christian year fits within, within our day-to-day our -day calendar. Our Christian calendar is broken into um, essentially, essentially into six seasons, call them seasons, that, that really are two halves. There is, there is a cycle uh, that goes from Advent around through Christmas and through Epiphany. And then we have a second cycle that goes through Lent and Easter and eventually comes back around and starts again at Advent. In this year, this Easter cycle and this Advent cycle, 
each one involve a time of preparation, right? So within the Christmas cycle, we start with Advent. Our Christian year starts at Advent. And it moves through preparation into celebration and the time of Christmas. And then it moves into what the Methodists, we Methodists call the season of Epiphany, which, which many of the other uh, congregations call ordinary time, a period of ordinary time between Christmas and the Easter. The Easter cycle begins with Lent, with this time for preparation. Right, so as we have a time to, to get ready. So this is where we are. We'll move into a time, a celebration for the season of Easter. And this will go from Easter until Pentecost. And then we'll have a long period of ordinary time that will go from Pentecost back around to Advent, right? And so these are the dates that we deal with this year. We'll come back to what this is in a second. But this is our cycle. And so we're in this Lenten season. Not all churches follow a liturgical calendar. This is kind of a thing that has come about over the centuries to give us a degree of orientation so that we know where we are and what's coming. And, and how we are to participate and, and to remember the stories. And, and as, as churches that follow this calendar go through the year, within worship each week, we follow the Bible texts with a set of readings that go through the Old Testament, that go through the Psalms, that go through the New Testament, and the Gospel. So there'll be four readings that we'll see each week. And, and again, we use some of those. And not all Methodist churches follow this liturgy, even though we do live within the, the overall seasonal calendar. Now, there's a lot of turf to cover in the Bible. So, so it's broken out into three years worth of readings. We call them year ABC, and they cycle back through. So right now, 21 is year B, will be year C, and then we'll be back to, and then when 2024, we'll be back around. And through each of these years, there's sort of different themes. There'll be different books that get focused on within, within the different, the different uh, uh, years. So take, for example, the gospel readings. In year A, it tends to be Matthew. And your B is Mark. And then Luke and your C. And then during those festival seasons, during the season of Christmas and during the season of Easter, there'll be a separate set of readings that are very particular to that time. And that's when, with respect to the Gospels, we tend to see readings from John. Now, I'm going to have a gospel, an Old Testament, a psalm, and a New Testament reading. Do these connect at all? Well, even though the lectionary works hard to connect them during that time from Christmas until Pentecost, one might look at them and say, I'm not so sure. But with those readings, the, the organization says that the gospel reading sets the theme for the other readings. During that long period of time from Pentecost back to Advent, it's really just a sequential reading to make sure that we don't stick to just our favorite 10 verses and that we see the Bible. And again, some, some uh, churches are more tied to this lectionary than others. Some pastors are tied more to it than others. Interestingly, Tom is using the same passage from Corinthians that I have today. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, right? So it's a good way to give us a path, to give us some orientation through the year and to give us some orientation through the Bible. Well, so let's take a look at what we have today. And oh, by the way, um, 
the readings, you can find them. Uh, this is the one that I tend to use, the, the lectionary at uh, Vanderbilt, and they provide the readings and they provide, they actually provide a lot of nice uh, uh, PowerPoints too, so that's cool. But the Methodist calendar has, has in it, once in a while, we'll tweak some of the edges around it and it'll sort of emphasize different themes. So Lent, we're in the season of Lent. This is the third week of Lent. Tell me, what do you think of when you think of Lent? What comes to mind? And feel free to unmute and jump in. Preparation. Preparation, preparation. Now, what kind of preparation? Fasting. Okay, okay. What are you preparing for? Easter. Okay, okay. So that preparation often has introspection tied to it. The fasting part, right? We always talk about giving something up for Lent, which has always confused me, right? So people give up things that they shouldn't ought to be doing for Lent so that they can go back to doing the things that they shouldn't ought to be doing once they get to Easter. And that's always perplexed me. I didn't understand that. Or, oh, I'm going to quit eating these things that I shouldn't be eating in the first place. And you know, once I get to day after Easter, I can pig out. So right after Kathleen and I had moved here to Atlanta, we happened to be in the Kroger's on the day after Easter. And they had all, and by all, I mean all of their Easter candy on sale for a quarter. And I don't just mean a Cadbury egg for a quarter. I mean the bag of Cadbury eggs and the bag of Dove. It was, we spent 20 bucks. And, and by about Tuesday, it was like, get this stuff out of here. I took it all to the office. That's going to be the downside of, of this change in office. What are you going to do with your Halloween candy? You know, <laughs> you'd be forced to eat it. Um, but so we do give things up. We do take a time for introspection and reflection uh, and, and to look at, at how should we be reorienting our lives. And this is the thing that, that we can do as individuals. This is the thing we can do as a family. family. Um, actually, Kathleen and I were talking not too long ago, and she asked if, if I had ever done a, a, a program of fasting. And when we were... <clears throat> When we were little, our church made an emphasis on doing a churchwide, fat, like daytime fast. And we did that as a family. We made a point of fasting on Saturdays and taking what we would have spent for that and using it to give. And, you know, I remember it to this day, and I was only like seven years old. But we do take this time of focus uh, to, to look into ourselves. Preparation is a real good thing, though, to, to think about with respect to Lent. The earliest times of Lent were really times of preparation to enter into the church. This is the time where new Christians were, were guided and educated and taught in preparation for baptism at Easter. So it's like confirmation class, right? This was one of the earliest practices of Lent. So how long is Lent? 40 days. 40 days. Well, but didn't it really start like on the Ash Wednesday, count all that out to, to the day before Easter is really more than 40? Well, that's because it does not include Sundays, right? Why 40 days? We remember Jesus' time in the wilderness. He went into the wilderness for 40 days. We remember the 40 years of Israel in the desert. We remember the 40 days of Noah on the boat. We remember the 40 days comes up over and over and over. So in Chapel Roswell the other day, Mary, actually it was last week, Marion pointed out, and I thought this was really interesting and, and made a lot of sense for me, that very often, theologically speaking, 40 days is not necessarily when, when we talk about 40 days. It doesn't mean, okay, let's count the days and tear the pages off the calendar. 
But theologically, when we talk about 40 days or 40 of something, it's long enough to, to do what's necessary, the sufficient time to do what is necessary. So Noah waited on the boat long enough for, to, to, to make everything right. Okay, Israel wandered long enough. Now, 40 years, fine, but it was, they needed that long. Jesus went to the desert for long enough to do what was necessary. And in 40 days, that was what was accomplished. But that, that as a symbolic term, 40 days generally can mean you took long enough to do it. You didn't rush it long enough to do whatever is necessary. But we know that at the end of Lent, something new is coming. Something new is coming, right? And it's going to rock our world. So this Sunday, the third year of third Sunday of Lent in year B, our three our readings for today, our Old Testament reading comes from Exodus. Our Psalm is Psalm 19. Our New Testament comes from 1 Corinthians, and our gospel comes from the second chapter of John. So let's look at these. And then we'll see if we can figure out how these are connected and what the lesson, why we think of these in terms of Lent and how we can use these to help us become oriented towards where we're headed. So the first lesson, the Old Testament lesson, is a familiar one from Exodus chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them because I, the Lord, your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I'm loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord, your God's name as if it were of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks. But, on the, se but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not make any work on it. Not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals or the immigrant who's living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that's in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day. That's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord God is giving you. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. So this is familiar, this is familiar. And it's interesting how much we have, have used this as our guide. The 10 commandments set down a path. They set down some orientation for us. And, and the people of Israel looked at this and says, okay, so give me a little more precise directions. Get, help me understand this more precisely. Um, and, and through their own wisdom, try to pull more out of it, try to create more in terms of how exactly shall we go through and do this. And, and this leads to long uh, discussions amongst the rabbis that give us all of the discussions that, that help to form our, our faith and our understanding of who God is. So we'll come back to all of that. But as we go on into the rest of the readings, um, I don't know how many of y'all go to Chapel Roswell or how many of y'all go to, to the big church, but I really enjoy Chapel Roswell. I really enjoy uh, uh, and, and I'm so happy that Marion is a part of, of our leadership. Um, in January, she did a sermon uh, around the Psalms that she used some of the ideas from Walter Brueggemann's book, The Spirituality of the Psalms. And, and one of the things that they do in Chapel Roswell is that they have uh, book suggestions. 
they kind of every month make some suggestions from either the pastors or some of the people in the congregation of these are, are, are books that you would find interesting and helpful. So Marion says that this spirituality, the songs by Walter Brueggemann is a short and easy read. It's short. Not so much on that easy part. The more time I spend with Marion, the more impressed I am with, with her level of deep thinking and her messages. But so she took the ideas that Walter Brueggemann presents in the Psalms and, and really played them out as a part of the service. The congregation helped to develop a Psalm that reflected where they were, right? And I think that was a really powerful thing. And the ideas that Walter Brueggemann uh, carried forward, I, I think really apply throughout our Lenten journey and throughout the, the readings for today. So one of the things that he talks about is that we have different times in our lives. And that if you look at the Psalms themselves, you can kind of categorize them with these times in our lives. He says that we have times of orientation where he says human life consists in satisfied seasons of well-being that evoke gratitude for the constancy of blessing. Think of Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever, right? That sort of overwhelming thanksgiving and praise and, and, and basking in, in the glory and the love of the Lord. That's one of those times that we see in the Psalms. But we also find psalms of disorientation. And he says that in these seasons, human life consists in anguished seasons of hurt, alienation, suffering, and death. These evoke rage, resentment, self-pity, and hatred, among others, among others, right? And you'll find psalms where the psalmist is crying out. We, we talked about laments back this last summer. And, and this is the Psalms of Lament, where, where the people are crying out that, look, God, what the heck is going on? Aren't we supposed to be your special folks? Why is this happening to us? Uh, are you still there? Knock, 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 knock. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And then he talks about the fact that we then have times of new orientation, where human life consists in terms of surprise when we're overwhelmed with the new gifts of God. When joy breaks through the despair, where there has been only darkness, there is light. And that we have psalms that show this out as well. And these all often happen within the same psalm. So let's look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So as I was looking at this this week, this whole section made me think of something that this is Larry Hunt's fault. He suggested that I read N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright has a book called uh, Simply Christian. And one of the things that he talks about is how different people experience God. And that those people who talk about how they experience God in nature and in the creation may be right, but they don't get the whole story because the, what you see through God's handiwork is certainly echoes of God's voice. But it's not the voice itself. It's not the whole message. There's more to it. I'm not going to know about Christ's love by looking at a waterfall. I'm going to know about God's power and about God's provision and about all manner of things like that. But I'm not going to get to the details and the specifics. But this is still an orientation time. The heavens and, and the creation is, is, is demonstrating its praise. 
in, in the heavens, he cut, has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them and nothing is hid from his heat. God has providence over all of it, right? This is very much a, a, an orientation kind of a thing. The psalmist goes on and talks about God's law. The law of the Lord is perfect, right? reviving the soul the decrees of the lord are sure making wise the simple the precepts of the lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the lord is clear enlightening the eyes the fear of the lord is pure enduring forever the ordinances of the lord are true and righteous altogether so here we're seeing that 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 we get direction from the law. Now, if we go back to the Ten Commandments, is that the whole law that they're talking about? No. I mean, if you ask, when, when they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said straight up, love the Lord your God with all, God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Torah says this. This is the Shema. Uh, this is the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. One of the things that I did do in the last uh, couple months was when you read that passage in Deuteronomy, it goes on to say, bind these words on your hands and on your forehead, on your doorposts. And in Jewish households, they'll often have a mezuzah on the entrance to the house and sometimes on the entrance to each room. And the mezuzah is a container where they bind these words as a way to orient themselves to each to each room. And I don't know if you can see or not. Uh, you can't see, you can't see from here. I purchased a mezuzah for my office so that I have one on my office so that it'll be before me as I come in. I like that as, as an idea, as a way to make sure that I remember this about the law. But we still need help figuring out what, how, do we, how do we put this into action? What is the orientation that this gives us? Orientation points me in a direction, but I have to stay on that path. The psalmist continues, more to be desired are they than gold. He's talking about God's law and, and the wisdom that comes with it. Even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. But he shifts here. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping with them there is great ward. But who can detect their errors? Who can detect their errors? Not the errors of the law. How am I going to know when I screw up? Clear me from my hidden faults. How do I know when I've inadvertently trespassed God's law? Or when somebody is leading me astray, keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Help me. Help me. I've lost my way. I'm afraid that, that as great and, and holy as the law is, as perfect as it is, that I'm not always and I can't always find my way. And I may have sinned without realizing it. Now, John Wesley would have other words to say about that. But, and that's another talk for another day. But the worry is that I, I, I don't know that I'm on the right path. So let's slip again. Our gospel reading comes from the second chapter of John. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, doves, and sheep and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. So if we stop right there, what does this scene look like to you? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we know the next few verses, but from the perspective of the people in the temple selling cattle and sheep and doves 
and exchanging currency, what were they doing? They were helping people to be able to carry out their religious obligations. The people coming to the temple were coming there to offer sacrifice. They may have traveled a long way, and it wasn't terribly feasible to drag a cow behind you, right? It's a lot easier to sell the cow you had at home, convert it into money, carry the money, and convert the money into a cow when you get back, right? That's how we do things. And so, so you know, we talk about whether or not they were extorting and charging exorbitant prices and taking advantage and things like that. But, you know, let's, let's go with the words that are written there. People have to have the sacrifices in order to make the sacrifices. They have to have the currency used in the temple because the temple defined what currency could be used. And if you're coming from the Greek lands and you have Roman currency, it's not appropriate to purchase a, a sacrifice to the Lord with, with the money of the oppressor. So they're doing these things because they, they thought it was the thing to be doing to be helpful. How many churches have a bookstore and a coffee shop in order to help people come and to find the resources they need and find companionship in the church, right? I mean, to some degree, commerce is commerce, but then let's, you know, there's, there's also edges to it of whether or not it's, it's good or bad. Within the scope of this, within this scene, though, here comes Jesus. He made a whip of ropes and chased out, chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciple remember, disciples remembered that it was written, passion for your house consumes me. So this is a, certainly a time of disorientation. Before Jesus starts this, I think that, that you see the people in, in the temple, and they thought this was a time of orientation. They understood how they were related to God. They were participating within the sacrifices to God, and, and they were going along, I guess you would say, fat, dumb, and happy. And Jesus comes and says, let's, let's tip over the tables. Let's make it different. Let's disorient things. And, and those, those feelings, no doubt, of anger, well, clearly the feelings of anger on the part of the people there and confusion. And, and what do we do with all of this? Have jumped to the top, right? Um, and I think that under, the overwhelming direction that I see in all of this is that when we go back to the Old Testament reading and we have the, the, the Ten Commandments, they point us in a direction towards God. And, and we reemphasize in the Psalm that that direction is absolutely the right direction. But we're bumping into the edges and trying to, to, to kind of skirt around and we're lost some of that direction in trying to, to do the right things. It's you end up in the wrong place, one good decision after another. So Jesus is putting them back on track. I, I happened to in the morning, this morning, be listening to um, day one while I was in the shower and the pastor was talking about that, that Jesus didn't just walk in and get mad and start tipping things over. He counted to 10. He made a whip from ropes. And, and he was pointing out that the process of stopping to do that kind of made Jesus stop and process what was going on. It's a, a pause, right? That's a time-consuming thing. And, and I think I may have to go back and listen to him again to really get to what he was going to. But that's another interesting thing that got pulled out. The Jewish leaders were upset by all of this. They're like, what do y'all mean? This is the anger and the disorientation. We're doing God's work. We're doing God's work. And here you are. And what gives you the right? What gives you the right? Show us that you have that authority. And Jesus says, 
I do. And the, 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 the authority that he gives them, they just don't understand. But, but the disciples will remember later on when he talks about later on in, in, at Easter time when he says, I'll raise this temple up in three days. One of the interesting things that N.T. Wright talks about in his Simply Christian is, is how in Judaism there's a distinction between the heavens, the realm of God, and the earth that is the creation. That there's distinct things. And that in, in Judaism, the temple was the place where those overlapped. And here we see that in Jesus, Jesus is saying, I'm the place where this overlaps. I'm the place where, where God is dwelling amongst us. I'm the place, right? And he's giving them a new orientation. Paul goes on in our last reading. He says, the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are being destroyed, but it's the power of God for those who are being saved. It's written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I'll reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And in this, I think that we're finding Walter Brueggemann's new orientation. He says the old orientation was was insufficient when we tried to rely on on our limited view our limited understanding and we used our wisdom and we used our intellect so when we used our wisdom and our intelligence to try to come close to god we would fail we would fail in that so that we needed to to allow god to come close to us as well it's kind of interesting that that the word today's debaters that he uses here, that Paul uses, he pretty directly sets the, the Hebrew idea of today being this age versus today being part of God's age and, and our own time with God in and of ourselves as a part. There are different terms for that in Hebrew. And he's using the Greek for, for this current time to highlight it against the idea of God's time. And that God, in God's time, has made all of that figuring not the way to find this new orientation. The new orientation came to us on it, on, through God, through God, in God's wisdom. God determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. God has come to us. God has, has, has come to us through Jesus with God's own authority. And in that, all of us are called because Christ's power is God's power and it's God's wisdom. So we find that new orientation. We go from a time of feeling like we have things figured out and we're, we feel like we're in a great relationship with God and Lent often can be that time of disorientation where, where things we're preparing, but we can also in repentance and in reflection understand that, that maybe things aren't quite as where they ought to be. So we think about how we move from that season towards a new season. We want to move towards a season of, of new orientation, whether we're currently feeling oriented or disoriented. We want to think about whether or not those religious things are really what we're supposed to be doing. The people selling doves likely it's not really felt like they were doing the things that helped people make their sacrifices. Is that really helping? 
we need to think about in the repentance of Lent to reflect and to, to dig inside ourselves to see what are we hiding and what needs to be revealed so that we can fix those things and work towards them and not just stop doing the things we shouldn't do or give up something for the season. How do we fix those things? How do we move forward and prepare for this new orientation that we know is coming? So when the psalmist lamented, there was still always a confidence. Even in the deepest lament psalms, there's still a confidence that God is still in charge and that God will provide new orientation. And so we have to re reach down and find that confidence as well. The psalmist ends up with a very familiar verse. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That to me is absolutely a new orientation. He's gone through that time of disorientation, out of a feeling of confidence, the unconfidence and being shaken to now that hope and that new and that new place with God. And Paul tells us again, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it's the power of God for those who are being saved. To those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And so there, I think we find our way back into a new orientation. Amen. Thoughts, questions, discussion?